Thank you everyone for joining this session. Uh, my name is Saumin. I'm a cloud solution architect uh, specialized in the cloud native technology in Azure. Uh, and I'm part of the Microsoft Global Partner Service Organization, and I'm based in the New Jersey East region. Uh, look like the slide went back or is good. David. Okay, so go to David. You should, you should have control. Okay. All right, um, and David and Steven, do you want to go through the introduction before I? Uh, okay, well, uh, so David Wright, I am a partner solution engineer, uh, engineer for globally for Microsoft. So I, uh, I am fortunate enough to work with uh, the great Microsoft team and then work through um, uh, the relationship there. Uh, and uh, I've been with HashiCorp for now nearly uh, over three years. So I've been here uh, and seen some great changes and great integrations with, uh, with the product set. Stephen. Thanks, David. Hi, my, I'm Stephen, and I'm one of the product managers on HCP console. Uh, I've been, today's actually my hash anniversary for first year. So I've been here for a year and lots of things, lots of exciting things are happening. I'm based in Seattle at the moment. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to showing some really cool things on HCP console. Cool. Thanks, David and Steven. I will start with a quick introduction about what is Azure Kubernetes service, and then we'll go and see the nice details about what, what is with the HashiCorp console and detail. So Azure Kubernetes Service is a fully managed Kubernetes service available in Azure. Uh, it, it, is, it is based on the upstream Kubernetes running in Azure. So you don't need to manage the underlying infrastructure. You can focus primarily on your application delivery and how we can build and deploy your applications on top of Azure. So another main advantage or the main uh, the goal of azure kubernetes service is to you can focus more on your application and it's a delivery rather than the underlying infrastructure for managing an a kubernetes platform and it is built on top of azure infrastructure and as well as it is deeply integrated with the with the common azure services like for example azure security monitoring identity etc we'll go into each of these details in the in the remaining section All right. So if you are managing a Kubernetes as a self-managed mode, you can do that one in any either on-premise or even if you're going with any cloud provider, you can install Kubernetes in an infrastructure as a service VM and you can manage it. But this is bringing a lot more management headache to you. Uh, you need to manage the underlying master nodes, worker nodes, it's a patching and upgrading, monitoring, etc. So managing a self-managed uh, Kubernetes is going to be really hard. So that is what the main advantage of any managed service for Kubernetes, like in this case in Azure, is an AKS. So if you are familiar with the Kubernetes architecture, primarily that it has a master nodes and a worker nodes or agent nodes. If you are using Azure Kubernetes service, the master node or the control plane is managed by Microsoft. So you don't need to manage the underlying infrastructure for hosting the managed nodes, uh, sorry, the, the uh, master nodes, as well as the HCD and all the underlying components, which is running on the master nodes, which is the backbone of a Kubernetes cluster. So you don't need to manage all of that. This is also coming with an SLA. So you can also get an SLA for the underlying master nodes and you can just focus on your applications and deploying in that one into the agent nodes. So that is a primary advantage of going with an managed Kubernetes like an AKS. And especially from looking from an enterprise level, uh, as we all know that Kubernetes is an open source upstream product and it is widely adopted now, but from an enterprise perspective, how we can ensure that we can provide a seamless developer productivity and security and operational excellence as well as unified management. So Kubernetes in Azure is built on top of these principles to making sure that if I'm adopting a technology like Kubernetes, how we can make that seamless experience for the developer productivity as well as how we can ensure that it meets all the security needs and then operational as well as unified management of the, all the components. So if you're 
looking at our Kubernetes service in Azure, it is built on top of all these key pillars what we are looking for, and it is an enterprise ready uh, compute infrastructure available in Azure. We'll get into more details about each of these pillars quickly. Uh, from a developer productivity perspective, there are different set of tooling available to make your journey to Kubernetes faster as well as seamless. Um, so for example, the draft is another open source technology uh, tooling available to you can take an application if it is not even containerized, you can you can easily containerize and you can push that one as a Kubernetes manifest into a running Kubernetes environment. And with the VS Code, we have a deeper integration with uh, with the IntelliSense for even for authoring a manifest as well as many different technologies around that one. And uh, the there is another uh, nice tooling available called the Bridge for Kubernetes. Um, especially, it will be helpful for if you are building a large distributed microservice based application. Um, as a developer, how I can make sure that I can test and service that I'm working on and uh, how we can test that integration with other services as some other developers are working. Uh, so with the Azure Kubernetes service, uh, this bridge for Kubernetes service is in integrated. So from your local machine, you can debug a service running in AKS and you can make that integration testing and everything pretty easily. And we have different pipelines available for either for GitHub as well as from Azure DevOps. If I want to set up a CI CD pipeline uh, for taking an application, containerizing the application, and pushing the image into a repository, and from a deployment pipeline, how I can push that particular application uh, to an underlying Kubernetes infrastructure. So, if you want to make all this, there are ready made pipelines available. You can easily integrate that. As well as if you don't want to like do that from from a GitHub perspective, you can go to AKS and then there is a deployment center available. You can easily pre-create all these particular pipelines from the Azure Kubernetes service in uh, in Azure. And there are a tooling like a distributed application runtime or Dapper. Uh, it is also an, another uh, great tooling available, and it's a deeply integrated with AKS. It's primarily helpful for building a a true microservice based application and then don't worry about the underlying state management and binding, etc. So this is another great capability. So from a developer productivity perspective, there are a series of tools available in the ecosystem and um, many of them are deeply integrated with the, with the Azure Kubernetes service. And from a security standpoint, Again, uh, the Azure Kubernetes service is built on top of the security and the compliance capabilities available on top of the Azure platform. And you can use, for example, uh, if you're using the Azure Container Registry, uh, you can enable the ongoing scans for the container images, and then you can make it part of your uh, container integration, um, continuous integration pipelines. And from an Azure Kubernetes cluster perspective, uh, you can leverage, for example, Azure Key Vault uh, for your secrets for encrypting the, and the data. Uh, instead of using the, the out-of-the-box Kubernetes uh, secrets, you can leverage the Azure Key Vault. And you can also uh, integrate the Microsoft Defender uh, with your Kubernetes cluster. And we have set of policies and uh, engines which will be looking for any threat detection, and it will report the operations team accordingly. And you can also Leverage the encryption capabilities available uh, for your agent nodes by with the help of Azure Key Vault uh, and also Azure Storage integration with Azure, Azure Kubernetes service. You can enable all this capability. And then uh, we have also the web application firewall uh, integration, Azure App Gateway, which is deeply integrated. There is also an, an App Gateway in ingress controller available. If you don't want to manage ingress controller in your AKS level, you can leverage the App Gateway uh, ingress controller as well. And your the whole Kubernetes cluster can be protected by enabling Azure Active Directory integration, which will be giving you an extra layer of security for your cluster management by enabling the role-based role access control, as well as a multi-factor authentication. And the entire cluster can be put on a private environment uh, that will help you to strip down the entire network uh, traffic to your own network, and then you can also enable the hybrid connectivity by establishing an express route with your on-premise environment, for example. So these are the main um, uh, the security capabilities available out of the box. And from an operational perspective, as we all know, this is a fully managed cluster. So it is coming with lots of built-in capability. 
You can also enable the automatic uh, uh, upgrades and it is available. Uh, you can also come up with a, a scheduled maintenance windows for restarting the nodes for some, for example, there are some updates happen and you can do that. And also uh, the horizontal port auto scaler is available by default. If you want to horizontally scale your application and as well as you can enable the cluster auto scaler. So that will help you to spin up more VMs in your node pool and scale it out and scale it down. And we have also CADA, it's a Kubernetes event driven auto scaler that is integrated with Azure Kubernetes service. So if you don't want to use the out of the box port scaler, but if you want to bring some custom scenarios, like for example, if I have some data going to a queue and based on the queue, I need to spin up more ports, uh, then you can use CADA. CADA is an, another open source um, auto scaler available. Uh, you can use it in anywhere Kubernetes or uh, uh, on-premise as well as Azure or any other cloud provider. And from an, a monitoring perspective, Azure Monitor is deeply integrated with AKS and, and there is something called Container Insights. And with the help of Container Insights, you can get all the logs coming from the Kubernetes cluster and you can get deeper insights onto that. You can also run uh, the, the custom queries and generate reports based on that uh, by integrating Azure Container Insights. And by default, 99.95 uh, SLA um, available for your API server, that is for that time. And there are several different types of node pools available in AKS. You can bring your own, uh, for example, the, the spot instance or reserved instance. So there are a number of ways you can reduce the cost of the infrastructure by creating the node pools accordingly. There is also a concept called virtual nodes available. So that is that is if you want to run the node pools for the Kubernetes cluster on a true serverless fashion, then you can enable the virtual kubelet and then your application will be running uh, in more of a, a true serverless fashion. It will be very helpful for a burstable workload scenarios. And then finally, from a unified management perspective, there are different toolings available. We have something called Azure Arc. You can use Azure Arc to manage the Kubernetes clusters across. Uh, for example, it could be running in an, uh, AWS or Google, or it could be running in on-premise environment. But, if, but from an operation standpoint, if I need to manage all these Kubernetes clusters, and if I want to apply the monitoring and policies, identity and everything across all these clusters seamlessly, then you can use uh, Azure Arc. That is another great capability. And during the Ignite, we have also announced the, uh, the AKS Fleet Manager. So that is another uh, tooling available from a unified management perspective to manage different AKS clusters in a, in a unified fashion. And GitOps is, is deeply integrated as well. So you can, you can enable the Flex Operator for Kubernetes. So you can uh, set up your pipelines and your uh, GitOps by just a matter of turning it on in your cluster and you can manage that one. And again, the same thing you can integrate with Azure Arc. So you can, if you have multiple Kubernetes clusters, including AKS, you can manage everything with the help of uh, Azure Arc. So we, since it is an upstream, Kubernetes version running in Azure, um, you can you can leverage many of these uh, fully managed and supported AKS add-ons, which are the ones that we have seen in the previous slides. But that is not the limit. You since since it is an upstream Kubernetes, anything available in the in the cloud native computing foundation for Kubernetes, you can bring it in your cluster and you can run it. And that's what you are going to see with the with the HashiCorp today. You will see lots of great things about how you can integrate the HashiCorp console in an existing AKS cluster. All right, so that's it from an AKS overview perspective and I'm going sending over to David. Thank you, Salman. So what is it we're talking about today? Well, we're gonna talk about console. So what is console? But just from a kind of overview perspective and uh, console is a, a modern service networking solution. So. What that means in real terms is that we are creating a single source of truth, which allows for services to be able to be connected together. And so what we're primarily looking to do is drive those services together to allow for point-to-point -point connectivity across uh, an environment. Now, whether that is environment is, as Simon said, uh, a modern kind of Kubernetes-based application, 
whether it is a hybrid scenario I mean that across multiple different platforms or whether that is into uh, multi-cluster the whole point of console is to create this point of single point of control across that infrastructure uh, element and so this also means that because console is tied into other HashiCorp products like Terraform we can actually extend our reach outside of the traditional um, Kubernetes environment into traditional networking environments. So whether that's Cisco or Paolo or F5 network or even VMware clusters. And because we have this single source of truth, this allows us to be able to register those services automatically in those uh, ephemeral environments and then actually take action against infrastructure components in traditional architecture, which means now that you have the flexibility of the cloud ag agnostic type of environment where things are ephemeral and spinning up, but being able to integrate those into those uh, more traditional environments. And then as you start to progress and as you start to get this single source of truth across your uh, infrastructure, so you can then start to look, think about how do I implement security across that as an over overlay uh, architecture. So now how do I implement a service mesh, which is the ability for services to have point-to-point -point connectivity and control over a secured MTLS connection between those two points. And all of these are based around services. And I think the big fundamental shift in my mind when thinking about this is, is that with the tradi traditional networking where it was domain based, so you had either an IP domain or a, v a VLAN domain or a routing domain that you were kind of put a context around um, what that um, what co group connected to what group in terms of those you know, inter-domain routing or inter-domain inter connectivity. With services, this is true service based. So it doesn't matter where the service with, uh, lives, so in this case, web, uh, and it needs to talk to database. Um, web could be made up of different components around different groups, different clusters, uh, and actually need to talk to database, which then lives outside in different elements. And so it is true services focused in that construct of how do I get web talk to database? And that's the only element that you think about in terms of this service discovery and this service association and therefore creating this service mesh. And so when we think about what that is actually going to try and achieve, this is this single control plane that we were talking about. And so in this construct, we are creating a control plane or control mechanism that allows for a, that single source of truth to be registered into that control plane. And then the different architectural environments being able to then query that, that control plane, that single source of truth, and understand where those services are. Now, obviously, this would have to have traditional networking components set around that. But once you have that underlying architecture, these services, as they now spin up and spin down, can be routed across this environment. So in this scenario, for example, we have a managed Kubernetes uh, in AKS. It spins up all of these wonderful new applications. They need to talk to or connect to an on-premise component uh, in that in our, one of our traditional data centers. There's a, an app component as, you know, that cannot be moved, for example. We all, we've all seen that scenario where I can't move this application because of X, Y, Z. And so how do, you, how do you join those two disparate worlds? Well, this is where that ephemeral world of, of the containers can spin up. We have the single control plane that registers it. We can make and reach out up to F5 and add in the new node that has spun up within that uh, within the AKS cluster into that load balance to be a service available on that on-premise component. So you're starting to expand that connectivity and that ability to connect those services across this, your entire suite. And you're not limited to, how do I do that within just uh, a, 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 a Kubernetes component? You can expand that and some of those services. And I know Stephen will talk about some of the uh, mechanisms as well around how we actually can then bring services in and out of those service uh, those service clusters and that make it easy for them to um, to actually consume services both inside and outside of that network. So 
really understanding her ability to expand and consume services across those entire elements. And so this is the fundamental thing that Confo is trying to achieve. We're looking to in integrate any service into your service mesh. So how can we take Azure Blob Storage? How can we take an S3 bucket? How could we take a, um, a, a uh, an existing application and build that into uh, and integrate it into your um, into your uh, service mesh in a secure mechanism. How can we make sure that we can extend that across multiple uh, different components? So different platform types we're running because console could be installed as a uh, as a binary. What that means is, is you don't actually need to be able to have full blown um, Kubernetes cluster to actually be able to stand up console to run it. So in an environment on a traditional um, on-premise component, you could install this as part of uh, your VMware cluster, for example. And so as long as the environment can support uh, the binary to run those, uh, the, the console binary, you can stand up the cluster, you can connect those clusters together, and now you have the ability to bring anything within that domain into the service mesh, so extending and integrating. And then obviously, control is an important factor around that. So how, based around the services, you can now implement compliance and governance control using either access control list or intentions. And so the great thing with an intention is it is again service focused. So an intention being is I am only going to allow, allow web one to talk to web two, which could be my API to API communication, but I'm not going to allow web one to talk to my database because that isn't something that, um, that I, I need because it's the front end. And so what we're doing is that we're now actually, again, thinking around the service, creating those single sources of truth, tying those services together and being able to put control-based access around those services. So why is this, why do we need this? Why, why are our organizations looking for this? Well, because obviously to try and get a, a consistent, secure access across these different um, platform types is very difficult. Staff and, and and technical staff with the ability to understand the capabilities to build this, hence why there is AKS. You know, as, as it was said, that managing and doing DIY or building your own uh, Kubernetes cluster is very difficult. Integrating those uh, multiple clusters then becomes an even bigger challenge. And so, how can you simplify and make sure that there is an easy way to be able to do this? and try to make sure that there is uh, the right information and, and an easy way to do that so that the integration can be easily consumed uh, in a way that developers want to. So how do I integrate that uh, service discovery or that, that agent into my pipeline so that as my service comes up, it, it does everything for me automatically using mechanisms that I uh, already have built in or understand. So how do I have to Helm chart or manifest or use those the criteria that I already understand as part of my um, networking and, and discovery and service mesh uh, components. And so as with AKS, having a managed component around uh, taking that burden of building and doing DIY uh, support, though we have HashiCorp uh, Consult in our cloud platform. So this is a SaaS offering that takes that, that control plane management the underlying cluster management is then given the burden on to us for, to actually do. So updates, rolling changes, security, uh, and the baselining, and then giving you the, the capability to get up to speed in just making sure that you can connect and set the service intention as quickly and easily as possible across a, a, pla a cloud platform. So again, that thinking around, well, I've gone to all this effort to use a managed Kubernetes cluster to simplify my um, my management so now you can connect that but take that management burden and put it onto us to actually do the the heavy lifting and management with around console in um in our cloud for http and so where does this work best well a great example of this is is working with github the so github has implemented a few of uh hashicorp products one of those being console and where they use this is the service onboarding. So that service registration and that ability to bring new services on and importantly, to actually 
take services out. So this ability to be able to actually bring these services on across their environment means that when they're supporting their 65 million plus developers, they can actually scale to large, these large amount of uh, services, so 400 plus unique applications across over a thousand node deployments and bring on these services and connect them uh, and get them started quickly and easily. And this means that they have reduced their overall amount of effort to actually be able to accomplish that. So being able to do uh, more with less, being able to actually have a, a team scalable to be able to make the, the necessary changes and actually simplifying their architecture by reducing the amount of load balancing components and configuration needed to be able to bring those services on. Because as uh, Stephen will go through, console can actually allow you to do some actual traffic steering and um, blue-green deployments, canary, or, or whatever mechanism that you want to actually implement with console. So there is also that load balancing functionality built, built into that service. And so with that, I will now pass over to Stephen to go into some more of the deeper technical components uh, and share with you uh, his thoughts around that. Over to you. Thanks, David. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. So now that you've heard all the great things about AKS and ACP console, uh, let's take a closer look. So in the next se sections, I'm going to cover the following topics. I will show you how you can easily create a managed console cluster using the HCP portal. And then we're going to install console on a AKS cluster and deploy, deploy demo application using service mesh. And then we'll expand on that deployment using a feature called cluster peering. And finally, I'm going to use service mesh traffic management techniques to route application traffic. So before we jump in, um, let's take a look at what it means to deploy in Azure with HCP console. So when you're creating your HCP console cluster in uh, HCP, uh, you're, the, the console cluster will be hosted inside a virtual network that is managed by HashiCorp, hence the name HashiCorp Virtual Network. When you're running your console cluster in a production environment, it will be running with three nodes, with one being the leader and two followers. So uh, console uses a consensus protocol based on RAT. It allows us, it allow, allows console to operate without an interruption should one of the nodes go down. So on the right side, this is where you typically your Azure application or, or your Azure resources will live. In this case, you have a couple of services running in AKS and a couple more running virtual machines. So the way that you will set up this connection between the two, there are two modes to do this, right? You can set up your console cluster in public mode where the two sides will communicate with each other using public connectivity. And of course it's secured by TLS or for those with higher uh, security requirements, you can set up your console cluster in a private mode. And in this mode, you're required to peer your HVN or HashiCorp virtual network with your Azure VNet. This means that all the services will, will be communicating with the console cluster over their private uh, IPs. And this also means that all the traffic, uh, the network traffic will stay within Azure's infrastructure. So now let's go take a look at HCP console. So this is landing page for HCP console, and we're going to sign into my account and take a look. We support single sign-on. So here I'm going to log in with my GitHub ID. All right, so on this landing page, you can see a selection of our products. Today, we're going to jump into console. And within console, you'll be presented with a list of your active clusters. You'll get, a, get their status and their version and some additional information that might be helpful to you. So let's go ahead and see if we can create a cluster. So there, there, there are two options to create a cluster. As mentioned, you know, Terraform is a great tool to automate your infrastructure, so you can codify your, your infrastructure deployment and, 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 do, and deploy that de, and deploy that deployment repeatedly. So for, but for this demo purpose, let's go through the UI and if I, if we have time later, I'll come back to this Terraform automation. So remember earlier I mentioned that your console cluster will be hosted within a private network. So this is the part where I can select one of my existing console uh, existing HVNs and create additional console clusters in here. Or maybe for purpose, let's go ahead and create a new one. Let's call this webinar demo. And we're, let's say we're going to create this in central US. And you can define a range of IPs that will be assigned to your HashiCorp products that runs inside uh, this HVN. 
And down here, you're able to name, give your cluster a name, let's say demo, webinar. And then you'll, you'll be able to choose one of the two cluster tiers that's, that's currently available. So if you're running this in a production environment, where you're highly recommended to run this in standard because it offers the three node redundancy. Uh, but if you're just uh, if, but if you're just starting with, let's say, a proof of concept or new projects, uh, development cluster is a very cost-effective way to get started. And as you can see, if you were to select standard, you can then select a size of your cluster based on the scale of your operation. So for this purpose, let's go with development. And down here, you'll be able to choose the mode that the cluster is operating in, either in public or private. And finally, you can select one of the versions that's available for you, and you can go ahead and create this cluster. So now this is going to take about five to 10 minutes, and I don't really want to sit here and wait for that. So I pre-created a couple, couple of clusters here that we'll be using to experiment. So when you jump into the UI, you'll see that we're pro providing some guidance to get you started. So there are some video contents and helpful links for you to read additional uh, developer resources that is provided by HashiCorp. You also get a uh, cluster detail about about your cluster. You can you can see if there are newer versions. For example, in this case, there's a newer miter version that you can update to. Uh, on top of that, we also take snapshots uh, because this cluster was just created uh, recently. There hasn't been any snapshots taken. We take snapshots daily, so in, in the event that something were to go wrong with your cluster, you can always restore this. And of course, you can also create a snapshot anytime. On the platform logs. Uh, once this loads, you'll, you'll be, be able to see the activity that's happened to this cluster. And in this case, you can see that the operator, Stephen Wang, created this cluster, and it was a success. All right. So this, this UI will allow you to, to manage your, 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 your console cluster, but to use the, the capabilities inside your console, you will use the console UI. Now, this is this is essentially a way, this is essentially where you'll probably spend more of your time in because this allows you to take a look at your service health. Uh, you can manage your role-based access and uh, in terms of additional things. So here, I'm not able to select any of these because I haven't authenticated myself. So let's go ahead and let's get, uh, generate a admin token. So I'm going to, to copy this admin token and then log into console here. So as you can see, we currently have just one service running and that's console itself. And most organizations will have multiple teams and some, some organizations even have multiple organizations within them. So here is where you can create your roles. For example, you can create uh, you know, one for your dev team, one for your uh, infra team, and then the list goes on. And you can also create individual policies that you can apply to those roles. And finally, you can create tokens that marry the two. So your, your team or your operators can log in and they, they, they should only have the access to do what you define as. So now that we have a working console cluster, I've also gone ahead and created an AKS cluster. Um, so let's see. So in this next section, I'm going to um, show you how, how you can install console on your AKS cluster and, and start deploying application. So let's go ahead and connect to this cluster. So this command essentially is, is reaching out to, to Azure and, and, and storing the credentials inside my, inside my environments. And now I am connected to this cluster, AKS Central. So I, today I'm going to install console using Helm. And you can think of Helm as a package manager for Kubernetes. Um, the way that this, this install works is the following. So I'm... I'm not going to run this command just yet, but I'm going to show you what this command looks like. So what this is saying is I'm going to use Helm to install a deployment call, and this I'm going to give it a name console. It's going to pull from the HashiCorp repository, and I'm going to choose version one. As you can see, I'm feeding in some configuration files that will be used to configure this in the installation. So let's take a look at what this means. So this is a template uh, template for uh, how the Helm install. There are a few things that, there are three things that, that I would like to get your attention on. So number one, we need to, we need to configure the AKS cluster 
uh, we need to provide the host of our console, so the endpoint of our console cluster, so that AKS can reach out and say, hey, I would like to connect to you. And, and the, same, the same idea here is that when console needs to authenticate with AKS, we also need to provide an address or the API address for console to authenticate. So let's go ahead and get those values. So here I'm going to get the API server address from, from Azure. Next, I am going to get the public address of my cluster, of my console cluster. Save that. And lastly, you'll see that AKS will need a token. Remember the token that we created earlier? So AKS will need a token to be able to authenticate itself. So let's go ahead and create the secret inside our Kubernetes cluster. So I've gone ahead and created this token from uh, earlier, and now we're going to create the secret inside the Kubernetes cluster. With that created, and I'm just gonna make sure that this configurations file is saved properly. Let's go ahead and run the Helm install. So that is going to take a couple of seconds. Uh, now, while we're waiting, so what have we done so far? We've essentially created a console cluster on the left side. We also have our Azure Kubernetes environment on the right side. We haven't deployed any services and they're currently deployed. Uh, they're currently connected using the public connectivity. So let's see how things are going here. Great, so console is installed. So let's see, uh, let's get Let's, let's see what are some of the things that are running. So you see that console has successfully deployed, well, some are still coming on. So console has su successfully deployed the pods that's needed. So now that's, so now we actually have a fully end-to-end -end working environment for you to start deploying your applications. All right, so next part of this is I'm going to introduce an application called HashiCups. So HashiCups is a web, applica web application that we developed to showcase the capability of our products. It's essentially a coffee ordering uh, web application that allows you to select the coffee of your choice. You can add it to your carts, and then you can finally check out. So behind the scene, we will actually have the following architecture. So the same architecture as before, cluster on the left side, Azure environment on the right side. And here you'll see a few services running that will be uh, that will be supporting this application. So Nginx will be fronting our front end and public API. Public API will talk to the product API, which then stores some of the customer information, uh, ordering history and things like that in a Postgres instance. And finally, public API is also going to communicate with the payment service to process the actual payment. So what does that look like? So Let's take a look. So there is a HashiCorp folder, HashiCups folder. Here you'll see I have a few of my service definitions. I have the front end, I have Nginx, I have payments, Postgres, product, and public APIs. Uh, so the way that uh, you, the way to deploy applications in uh, Kubernetes that you you define the the containers that you're going to use and you configure that container. So in this case, let's take a look at payments, right? So here, what we're saying is we're setting a bunch of configurations of how to, how to configure our application. And we're telling Kubernetes where to pull this in, to pull this container from, and as well as the ports that it will uh, expose the service on. So let's go ahead and push. Uh, let's roll this, this out. So in, in addition to all these services that I'm creating, uh, I'm also going to push in an intentions file. So this is something that David's mentioned earlier. So intentions is essentially dictating which, which service can talk to another service. And let's actually go ahead and take a look at the portal to see what's happening here. So you can see that in addition to console service, now additional service are, coming, are being brought online. And as they come online, they're being registered in our service registry. Uh, let's wait for those to come up and I'll Let's take a look at the intentions. So in here, that intention file created the following intentions. It allow it essentially is to, is creating the, the 
relationship between all of these. So in, in this case, let's say public API should have access to products and should also have access to payment service. And you can see that public API here is allowed to talk to payments and public API is also allowed to talk to products API. And it's, all, it's all, always a good idea to have a default policy that denies all because you really shouldn't have any services that are open to all connections. Let's go back here. Great, um, all of our services are live, so. Let's take a look at uh, our demo. Uh, all right. So you see that our Nginx has an external, external IP here. Let's go here. And here's your hashi cups. So let's go ahead and maybe order a cup of coffee, add it to my cart. Let's go check out. And in order to check out, I've got to create an account and sign in. So let me go ahead and create an account, even from Seattle. Cool. So, you know, now you're able to fill in your card information. I'm not going to put my real credit card in here. So I'm going to use this function that will be created to quickly fill in the uh, fill in the form here. I'm going to call myself Steven and I'm going to pay with this awesome endless bottomless credit card here. So great. So you'll see a couple of things here. You'll see that my credit card, unfortunately, stored in plain text. It's not very secure, but the good thing is my payment process successfully and I'm, I'm able to get my coffee. And for those with a keen eye, you'll see that the encryption, encryption is disabled because we're, we're storing uh, our customers' credit cards and plain number. That's a terrible decision. So this is where I, I'll pitch in for one of our other products called uh, Vault, where you'll be able to use Vault to encrypt your, uh, your data in transit and your rest. But let's focus on, let's focus on console for now. So remember, so inside intentions, we currently have our public API talking to payments, right? So what would happen if I were to now remove some of these intentions, right? So let's go ahead and remove. So I'm going to remove some of the intentions in here. And now I suspect that Going through the same, I am going to fill in this credit card information. And while my order has been confirmed, I am not able to process my payments because it does not have the intention to talk to us. And now I'm not able to get my coffee and it's, no one's happy, right? So this is the symptom once you're, for example, if you're missing the intention that the payments will receive this commun communication for the public API, or let's say your payment service went down. All right, so let's get back to HashiCup. So, so now we've stood up a working environment of HCP console with AKS, and we also deployed a demo application. So what, you know, what can we do on top of this? So you know, after running this coffee business for a little bit, we realized we have enough demand from the East Coast of US as well as West Coast. And we also learned that having a single instance of payments is probably not a good, good idea. So what can we do to, to add some redundancy into our application? So I've gone ahead and created two uh, clusters, one on West US, one on East US, and I'm going to introduce a new concept called cluster peering. Cluster peering allows the console clusters to communicate with each other with each other, and sets the stage for the services to talk to the services in, in, in their peered cluster. Now, I, I mentioned set the stage here because just, just because the clusters are peered together, it doesn't automatically expose all the services across the clusters. You'll still have the ability to selectively, uh, selectively choose which service you would like to expose to your peer. In this case, I'm going to uh, expose the payment, uh, the payment service on the East US2 data center to my West US2, and I'm going to define a failover policy that says in the event that payments from the West Coast goes down, I will still be able to redirect those traffic to my East Coast. So let's take a look at what that means. So here I've created, I've pre-created these two clusters, one on the East Coast and one on the West Coast here. And you'll see that, uh, let's go inside there. UIs here, now they currently, so on the East Coast and West Coast, they only have a console and a mesh gateway. There are no services running. And if you look at peers, you can see that East, 
US2 is a peer of West US2. So let's go ahead and deploy our HashiCups into both of these environments, right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch between the contexts so because now I have two AKS clusters and I don't really necessarily want to authenticate all the time. I'm going to use the context here. So AKS. Let's first deploy HashiCups into our West US2 data center. And as services are coming up, the same thing goes here. And let's create, let's go ahead and deploy the same in East US2. And we should be able to see that the services are coming online. So now I actually have two separate instances of my web application running. So now, because the, the two clusters are paired, I'm able to export the service from one cluster to the other. And I will do that using what we call a service export. So let's take a look at what this means. So I've created a configuration that will that says that defines the following. I'm going to export my service, which is a payment, and I'm going to allow the West US2 data center to consume this payment. And I'm going to apply this configuration on the East Coast. And at the same time, I'm going to apply the following failover policy on, on the West Coast. So in the event that, uh, that a failure is detected, I'm going to fail over to my peer, which is East Coast US2. So let's go ahead and push those. Let's do export service first and I'll show you just in a second in the UI what this did. All right, so let's go back to the UI. So now, if you're on West Coast, you can see that. Let's give it a refresh. In addition to the local payment service, you now have access to a payment service that was exported from its peer, right? And also, let's go inside payments, and routing. So in the event that my local payment fails, I'm able to fail over to my other data center, which is my US East, East US 2. So now, let's first access the HashiCups inside West US 2. So here's my West Coast deployment. Um, and let's also get, these, yeah, let's actually just do, uh, go ahead and do this. So I'm going to, again, uh, place my order because it is a new instance. Uh, let's say, let's say David is going to, David accounts, we're going to order a cup of coffee for David. And again, we're going to use auto fill. You'll see that payment was successfully proce processed. Now, this is because it has access to its local payments. So let's go ahead and simulate what would happen if we were to so let's let's take down the payments inside West US. And you see that I've removed the payment service and you, you'll see that it's reflected here in, in the West Coast. The service has been deregistered, right? That's because we've taken away the payments, but worry not, we have now failed over to our East Coast data center. So here, the same application, uh, this is previous one. So in the same application, we're going to order David. I hope he likes another cup of coffee or well, let's choose something else. Check out, I want to give David, and there you go. So his payment was successfully processed. And so David's happy, now he has two cups of coffee. Our, our service successfully failed over to the other data center. So now we are, we're good to go, right? So what I've just shown you is one form of mesh traffic management. Right, that's, that was one of the techniques. We also have additional uh, features like service splitter. So what this allows you to do is, let's say if you're deploying a new version of your service, what you can do is 
direct a portion of your production traffic into this newer version to perform validation. And when you're confident with a newer version, you can progressively promote traffic, more and more traffic into your new service. So I want to end kind of work as we're getting closer to the end. I want to ask you this question. Does an end game infrastructure exist? Now, based on the innovation that's happening in the software and hardware world, and people are, you know, really, really smart people are coming up with really interesting, really interesting ways to think about your infrastructure. Or maybe, you know, your team inherited another shared service from a different team. Your company acquired another company that's running a completely different stack, completely different cloud, and you want to unify your, your cloud infrastructure. Or perhaps you're, you're currently on an on-prem, you're moving to cloud, or you're moving to multi-cloud. Here's where we think console can help you with that journey, right? Let's play through the same scenario we, we had before. Let's say you're currently running HashiCups on your on-prem bare metal or virtual machine environment. So let's say you want to eventually move this entire stack over to Azure AKS. Well, you already know what's going to happen. You put self, you can put a console cluster on your on-prem and where you connect all your services to this cluster. You can create your Azure uh, infrastructure and then also create an HCP console and connect with that Azure infrastructure. You can use cluster peering to connect the two. And when you're ready, now you can deploy your first payment service and using the service splitter, you can slowly migrate some of your traffic over. And then you can do this over time. You can do this with your product APIs. You can do this with your public APIs and finally front end, right? So you have control of how fast or how aggressive that you will, you will like to take your, your deployments. And, you know, traditionally you would think about lift and ships and it's a little daunting to really, you know, turn a switch on for everything. And it's often, it's not the most optimal when it comes to cost. This allows you to incrementally migrate your cluster over. And, now, while I'm showing you an on-prem to Azure migration here, the possibilities are really endless because, you know, you could be anywhere, uh, you know, from a combination of on-prem and, and cloud, and you're trying to move to, you know, only cloud, or you could be on the opposite end. You want to maybe perhaps uh, migrate some of your services into an on-prem. All of this can be done using console. So here's a recap of what we did. We created a console cluster on HCP, and we also installed console on APS using the Helm charts. We also deployed a demo application in HashiCups and expanded that deployment using cluster peering. And we also, I, I also share some of, some of the mesh traffic management techniques you can use to route your application traffic. Here comes the most exciting part. If any of this was it very, it was interesting to you, please go visit our HCP portal and sign up for an account. And by signing up, you'll get an, a $50 credit towards uh, trying out console or any of our uh, HashiCorp products. And with that, I've wrapped up my presentation and thank you for your time.